open this morning, I want to just tell you a little bit of a story that happened. It was 1988. I was living in Germany at the time, working for a organization called Nicht im Osten in Korntal, München. For all you Germans, you'll know exactly what that is. Korntal, München is there uh, near Stuttgart. And this was a mission organization, German mission organization, that would smuggle Bibles into communist Europe in 1988. We were renovating the roof of this warehouse where they housed all the Christian literature, and I was a volunteer helping them put the new roof on. Victor Blanc, who was one of the supervisors, says to me in German, go out on the roof and start working over in that area. And the roof had been torn off, there was trusses, and I looked to what seemed to be a concrete slab and I stepped on this concrete slab on top of a warehouse that was four or five stories high, approximately the same height as the ceiling in this very room. I was fooled. I didn't understand German. I stepped on a ceiling tile. I stepped out and I was there one minute, and then I raptured to the earth. <laughs> because I was fooled. There's two things. One, I did not understand what he said to me. And two, I was fooled, and I stepped out in faith on the wrong material. What happened next, as I was ah, falling through the air... Something happened that I will never forget. Something that has, I've come back to many times in my Christian life that God has used mightily while I was falling in the air. But to hear the rest of the story, you're going to have to hang tight. <laughs> Satan is going to give you, the world, a fake Godhead. I want to look at this in all of its essence this morning, and I want to prepare you for what is to come, which is what Barry illustrated. There will be a crescendo, a J-curve of the world detaching itself from religion. In other words, we're going to be looking at the fake trinity, the pseudo-trinity. We are going to be looking at the counterfeit trinity. The world will be confused, and they will be fooled, and they will fall. Unless somebody rescues them. It's taught in both Testaments, this whole Trinitarian concept. It says here, and this is a Hebraic concept because I know how all of you love that. It says in Genesis chapter 1, verse 1, the very first verse of the Bible, did you catch this? In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. In the Hebrew, the singular word for God would have been Eloha, Eloah. But the plural is used here, Elohim. Isn't it interesting that the word Elohim is plural, but it uses the singular verb for created? Now, if you know another language, you'll know what I'm talking about. A plural God should require a plural verb for grammatical consistency. But you have a plural God with a singular verb. So it's one God in three persons. It's genius. Right there in the first verse, that's what the Lord wanted the reader of the Bible to understand. He, they wanted, he wanted them to understand who he is and what he did to bring about the world with all of the contradicting views. In the New Testament, you see this Father, Son, and Holy Spirit explicitly mentioned in Matthew chapter 18, verse, uh, chapter 28, verse 19. It says, go therefore to his disciples after he's about to ascend and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. 
So all members of the Trinity are involved in the most crucial social example of somebody testifying and being baptized and being acclimated into the family of God, the church. And without all three of the members of the Trinity, it is not God's design. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. This doctrine appears in all of the major Christian creeds. In fact, the Christian creeds were engineered to address false teaching about the identity of God himself that was being already attacked in the first, second, and third centuries. For example, adoptionism, they were saying that Jesus was born into the world and that he became God-like. Okay? Okay. Pretty crazy, but that's what some of these disciples had to write against. And a lot of the early church had to write against many heresies that were disseminating throughout their time. Arianism, which is probably the most prolific and most obvious one, if you've read anything in history of the early church, you will not escape Arianism. This is a gentleman that lived between 250 to 336. He was a priest in Alexandria, and he was professing Christianity. And he says, no, no, Jesus was a special creation of God, but not God. And the Spirit of God is just a force. This is exactly what modern-day Jehovah Witnesses believe, modern-day Arianism. You'll see a lot of these fake concepts about God's existence, who God really is. You'll see that the devil is even working within the so-called church to propagate his deception. Satan has always sold the world on false gods. In 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 3 through 4, it says to the Corinthians, which were a mess, by the way, but even if our gospel is veiled, it is veiled to those who are perishing, whose minds the God of this age has blinded, who do not believe. Lest the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine on them. See, the devil's agenda is very simple. If he can fool you into thinking that you're secure and you step out in faith in whatever you have managed to come across as far as his coping mechanism or his design for you, he can have you sucking away on error and it will cost you your life in the end if something does not change. He is mimicking that which is real and he is doing a good job at it probably better in this day and age than ever in human history. When it says image of God, Jesus is the perfect image of God. The Greek word is icon. He is an exact model of God the Father. And if you want to know what God God the Father thinks, if you want to know how God the Father's character is, if you want to know what God the Father's personality is, if you want to know anything about God the Father, you look at the Son. You you ever been to like an event and you go to that family and that family standing there, maybe it's dance or hockey or whatever, and you see the son of of a man and it's like a little clone. It's like a little version of the the guy. And that's two people that that made that. Have you ever met somebody that so, they they so, so much look like their parent? That is what this verse is meaning. Now, I was falling through the air. (laughs) But before we get to that, let me just throw up a few more slides. There is, in pop culture today, a moving away from monotheistic religions, religion itself. We covered that with Pastor Barry. In the ancient days, however, leading up to the first century, people would worship many gods. Greek and Roman gods of mythology, including Atlas and Jupiter. A lot of this uh, so-called, these so-called gods are the foundation of a lot of today's video games. A lot of the video games bring back ancient uh, gods and they are integrated within the system. Granted, a lot of them you have to kill these gods somehow with swords and knives and machine guns, but whatever. Um, Canaanite gods were some of the most evil gods, but they mimicked and led people astray to the point where they dropped their water on the floor. (laughs) Let's put this over here. Um, You have altars in the Middle East, particularly there's one in Megiddo, Israel, 
uh, the site of Mar Armageddon, the actual city, where there's a big altar where they would regularly sacrifice children. Can you imagine? Family has a child, a little crying baby, and because they look at their financial, agricultural, and social system within these religions, they were promised that if they would sacrifice the most prized life form, that these gods would give them back blessing for their crops, for their cattle, for their beasts, and be blessed. They were fooled. The ancient Near East gods were no different, Ishtar and others. And there's a resurgence, even interest in Norse gods because of Marvel comics, you know, Thor and Odin and Loki. These Norse gods are uh, fascinating for a lot of young people. But there's one thing that I find amazing. Here I am last night watching the History Channel, and this slide kind of came out of the History Channel. Just last night, we created this. There is, and I didn't know this, um, petroglyphs that have similar images throughout Australia, South America, Europe, Africa, Japan, and other countries as well. This is the words of the History Channel, not mine that are saying that there were, and I saw this on the, the TV as well, similar images, and all of these people are proposing the solution of why they all look similar when they didn't have the travel methods that we do today, of saying there were extraterrestrials that interacted with all of these ancient civilizations. Isn't it interesting that wherever you have a big followers of aliens, watch this, there's not, it's not far, and you won't even have to look very far before you realize that a lot of these people are into the paranormal and into occult. And a lot of these images that you see of modern-day aliens are identical in many ways to people that have witnessed so-called demonic manifestations. Now, all of this system of religion is going to merge like a funnel to the beast of Revelation, which we will look at more in detail in a minute. A few months ago, I was serving in my military reserve duty, and I uh, was just there in the office, and a young airman walks in, says, good afternoon, chaplain. I said, hey, have a seat. What brings you in? He said, well, I want a waiver so I can grow a beard. I said, okay. Um, why? You know, because beards aren't really allowed in the military unless you get a waiver. He said, I am worshiping Odin, Thor, and I am a Norse godsman. I said, sit down. <laughs> sit down. Now, look, okay, so just so that we're clear, because this is online, my job is to listen to the airmen and see if this is actually, uh, you know, if there's any validity to this. And, and I can also ask questions, any questions I want. He, he said, I said, are you the Walmart version or the Marvel version? And he, he was offended. Um, no, I didn't actually say that. <laughs> that would have been, if you're watching Chaplain's Corps, I know I would never do that. Okay. But what, here's what we did talk about. Now, this is anonymous. He said, no, it's real. I, I have an altar to Odin in my backyard. I said, Really? Have you ever asked yourself the question, um, what led you to this? And we started to talk about spiritual things. And it actually came out that he's fascinated with the supernatural. And I said, you know, can I share my story with you? I believe that I have found the chief God. The top. The, the God of all gods, even even more powerful than Odin himself. That's what I said. Would you be interested to hear? He's like, yeah. <laughs> Tell me more. Counterfeit. The, 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 Satan is offering people right now a huge buffet table of counterfeits. I want to put the definition of counterfeit straight from the Apple Mac program. This is what they're saying, and not me. They say it's an adjective made in exact imitation of something valuable or important with the intention to deceive or defraud. That's Apple saying this, not me. 
Okay, so here I am living in Israel in a little, um, it's actually, it was a silo that was used for um, hay and um, probably even manure. Amir remembers this. I had a big pile of manure right outside my front door. It was my last house when I lived in Israel. It was a transition home, just for the record. And there I was, and the owner, he, he, he lived just straight up the road, and he, he said, uh, it is time for you to take uh, the rent. So bring, bring me to me the rent, and we will uh, have another month for you. So I went over there, and I said, okay, here you go. And he says, do you want to, do you know what is a counterfeit? Mezuyaf, he says in Hebrew. Mezuyaf. You know what is counterfeit? I said, yeah. He said, do you want to see counterfeit $100? I said, yeah. He showed me. And honestly, friends, I, I, I felt a real counterfeit $100 bill that it was so accurate to the original. And I was impressed. I, I stepped out on this ceiling tile. And I'm falling because I was convinced it looked real. It looked like concrete. John 8, 44b says this. <laughs> Satan was a murderer from the beginning. This is not new. Murder means he wants to destroy and kill you. And he does not stand on the truth because there's no truth in him. When he speaks a lie, he speaks from his own resources. These are not coming from God. For he is a liar and the father of it. Examples. Satan uses example. What we, I want to give examples of how Satan uses lies in this world. 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 1 through 5, Paul writes to Timothy, reminds him of something very disturbing. And I want to approach this from a completely different angle of perspective. He says, Know this, that in the last days, perilous times will come, for men will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, unloving, unforgiving, slanderers, without self-control, brutal, despisers of good, traitors, headstrong, haughty, lovers of pleasure, rather than lovers of God, having a form of godliness, but denying its power. From such per people turn away. Rust on cars. Mold in the sheetrock. Coming through with cauliflower fuzz that you can wipe off. All he does is he takes a nice can of paint. And he sprays over it and makes it look nice. He is glamorizing all of these things in pop culture today, making them not something to steer away from, but something that should be tolerated, and in some cases, even celebrated. In fact, some of them will hide behind some of these words and say, well, this person is a lover of money because you have to look at the backstory. Now we've got to bring in all the psychologists and we have to treat him. It almost, it's, we are actually to the point where more effort, more time, more money goes into the evil one than the victim. And if that's not enough, some of the people in the governments around the world will still condemn these things so they can remain popular to you, but behind the scenes they don't care. They'll eat a lunch without a mask and value cast all day long. Governor of California. <clears throat> See, I would do that, but I wouldn't say masks are, you know, I, if, if I don't have to wear a mask, I won't wear it. But I got one right here just in case. All right. I'm falling through the air. <laughs> now, I want to be careful because I was confused with the language of German and I was fooled that I was stepping on concrete. I went straight through some shelves with auto parts and some windshields, and so I'm falling in the air and I see an alternator. And I, <laughs> and I see glass. I'm very reluctant to share this, but I feel I have to. I felt the presence of God. And I, 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 I heard, I didn't hear audibly, but I, I knew in my mind, as I was falling, it would be okay because I had 
Jesus. I landed. Alternators, starters, and glass landed all around me. And this is four stories, the same level as the ceiling here, and I was not injured. I went back to work. Yeah, now, now <clears throat> there's something else that happened. I looked up and there was a hole, and I could see the sh sun shining down. And something else happened, which I'm going to wait till after <laughs> till we, till we get that. The world and all of its beauty is converging into a one-world religion, which, thank you, Pastor Barry, you were able to cover those pieces. I want to look at now the Revelation passages, and I want to show you just what Satan is going to do, and then I want to talk about the strategy that appears within this passage so that you can have the confidence to walk out of this conference today or out of this live feed or this video to know what the scriptures, the secret weapons that God has given, which really aren't secret. I want to first look at the counterfeit trinity. I want to look first at the dragon himself. Then we'll look at the beast that comes from the, um, the sea and then the beast that comes from the earth. And I want to make some comments along this, along this time. And I want you to know that we cover this in this book. And so there's a lot of more information that's going to be made available to you in the near future. A lot of this is not new. A lot of this is just as old as the, the book itself after John penned it. But it's so untaught within the church. And I'm telling you, pastors, I was a pastor for 17 years. I've taught through this. I've taught through the entire book. You can do it too. That's why we want to give you these, these tools. Revelation chapter 12. Now a great sign appeared in heaven. A woman clothed with the sun, with the moon under her feet. And on her head, a garland of 12 stars, symbolic of Israel. Okay? In fact, if you want to pick up on this and study deeper, go to Genesis chapter 37, verses 9 through 11, symbolizing Israel. The sun and the moon are like Jacob and Rachel and Joseph's parents. We have the 12 stars that represented the 12 tribes of Israel. Then being with child, she cried out in labor and in pain to give birth. Who is this child? Verse 3, and another sign appeared in heaven. Behold, a great and fiery red dragon. I like how it uses the word red. I, I, I wonder if this is because of all the blood that's going to be on his hands, of red blood. Having seven heads, ten horns, and seven diadems on his heads. Pastor Barry uncovered a lot of the meaning of that. His tail drew a third of the stars of heaven and threw them to earth. He's referring to the fall of Satan because he's going to reference Satan and the world coming around Satan to actually worship him through his false messiah or his version of the second member of the Trinity. A third of heaven threw from, the, from heaven down to earth, and the, and the dragon stood before the woman who was ready to give birth to devour her child as soon as it was born. So she bore a male child who was to rule all nations with the rod of iron, and her child was caught up to God and his throne. Then the woman fled into the wilderness. Do you see the progression, the chronology happening here? Israel has the prophecies that their Messiah would come from the tribe of Judah from their nation, particularly through Mary, who was of the ex exact uh, line from the line of David to fulfill prophecy. Jesus was caught up in his ascension after he conquered Satan, the sin, death, and demonic forces in a weekend he conquers. Three days he conquers sin, demonic forces, and death. What did you do last weekend? <laughs> That's kind of a big deal. Who else does that? Jesus does that. And he's given a chronology. Look what's happening here. He says, the woman fled into the wilderness after that. It's referring to the tribulation when this dragon brings another system of worship to worship him in his false messiah. Betrays the contract, the covenant that he makes with Israel in the tribulation, in the middle of the tribulation, and she goes and runs for her life, Israel, where she has a place prepared by God and that, that they should feed her 1,160 1, days, which is precisely three and a half years. Now, if you want to dig deeper, if you're watching this online, Feel free to write these things down. Daniel chapter 7, verses 7 through 8 and 24. 
And you can pick that up in uh, different places throughout Daniel, and you can really dig deeper. And war broke out in heaven, verse 7. Michael and his angels fought with the dragon. And this is, again, talking about the war in heaven and as, as he looks at the whole story of, this, of, of Satan himself. And the dragon and his angels fought, but they did not prevail. Nor was their place found uh, for them in heaven any longer. So the great dragon was cast out, that serpent of old called the devil and Satan. He calls it out right there. That's how we know this is Satan, because it says so. What does he do? He deceives the whole world. He was cast to the earth, and his angels were cast out with them. He wants the reader to understand the origin and the history of this initiator of a counterfeit trinity. Now watch this. Then I heard a loud voice saying in heaven, Now salvation and strength and the kingdom of our God and the power of his Christ have come. For the accuser of our brethren who accused them before our God day and night has been cast down. Verse 11, And they overcame him. That's you and me. And even the tribulation saints have this secret weapon list. By the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony. And they did not love their lives to the death. And I'm going to cover those in detail at the very end. That's kind of the punchline. Therefore rejoice, O heavens, and you who dwell in them. Woe to the inhabitants of the earth and the sea. For the devil has come down to you having great wrath because he knows that his time is short. Now when the dragon saw that he had been cast to the earth, he persecuted the woman who gave birth to the male child. Look at Israel's history even up till now. Tell me there's been a time where the nations have said, wow. We love Israel. It's the best, best tribe on the planet. Let's do everything we can to admire them and be their friend. Is that reality? No, it's not. Whether you look at modern-day Islam, what's going on there, the Holocaust, you look at the pogroms, you look at the Spanish Inquisition, you go all the way back. And even ancient civilizations have tried to take Israel over. It's not new. It's old as dirt. He persecuted the woman who gave birth to the male child. But the woman was given two wings of a great eagle that she might fly into the wilderness to her place where she is nourished for a time and times and a half time. What's a time, time, and a half time? Three and a half years. How do you know that? Prove it. In the ancient text, when you'd said a time, it meant uh, a year. And then times is two years. And then a half a time, three and a half years. Two plus one plus 0.5 equals what? Three and a half years. Okay? Now, uh, that's kind of my sixth sense of humor, my cynical side. All right? Look. Some people say the wings are airplanes. I, I don't know. We have a host of verses in the Bible that talk about... Uh, Eagle's wings being more of a symbol of God taking care and letting, letting his people pass through things. You'll mount on wings like eagles. You, you, won't, uh, you, won't, you, won't, uh, you, you, you will not be so destroyed that you can handle this. God is with you. It's the footprints poem. Israel was reminded of that over and over again. So the serpent spewed water out of his mouth like a flood after the woman that he might cause her to be carried away by the flood. But the earth helped the woman, and the earth opened up its mouth and swallowed up the flood, which the dragon had spewed out of his mouth. And the dragon was enraged with the woman, and he went to make war with the rest of her offspring, who keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. He's talking about the tribulation. Israel is in process of salvation. The ultimate salvation will come at the end of the tribulation. They will persevere. They are called the elect, the second coming of Christ. They will see Jesus whom they pierce. That's their Messiah. Up until then, there are 144 people from 12 tribes of Israel that are servants of God serving everywhere. Many of them probably will die, have their heads chopped off, who knows what. But a lot of Gentiles are coming to faith. This is tribulation saints. The church is already taking out. They will still have the word of God. They will still have the two 
tools, and they will come in mass. The pressure cooker will center on Israel and Satan's hatred for Israel. That's why he will erect the temple in Jerusalem. And halfway through, he will demand all the people worship him. In fact, he'll erect a whole system where you'll need a mark of the beast to worship the beast. There will be an icon or a, a statue, perhaps, of the beast, which will be a command to worship and it will all be Israel, you bow down. The, the intent is to ultimately destroy Israel. God's intent is to ultimately bring them to salvation and set up a kingdom with them as the world's superpower, and he is the king. The dragon is the fake version of Father God. He hates Israel, he hates the tribulation saints, but his future is set. See, I think he's so arrogant, he knows the word of God, and he knows what's happening around the world, but I think he's so arrogant, and I could be wrong, that he believes he can still win. That's just how self, de he's, the deception is actually self-deceived as well. Verse 1 and 3, 1 to 3 from Revelation 20 says, and we jump ahead. Then I saw an angel coming down from heaven, holding in his hand the key to the bottomless pit and great chain. This is at the end of the tribulation, right after Jesus' second coming. And he sees the dragon, that ancient serpent, who is the devil and Satan. He clarifies yet once again and bound him for a thousand years and threw him into the pit and shut it and sealed it over him so that he might not deceive the nations anymore until a thousand years were ended. After that, he must be released for a little while. Why? I think that's a great question for the Q&A this afternoon if you stick around. <laughs> Somebody should ask that question. I want to move straight now to talk about the false Messiah, the false Christ, otherwise known as the Antichrist. Are you sensing the gravity that if we don't do what we're supposed to do right now, and I know God has a sovereign plan, but I also know that we have a role in that. If we take that lightly and if we just blow it off, what could happen is that some of the people we know won't be raptured and have to deal with this. One of the big reasons why we wanted to cover this is so that we could equip you in an accurate portrayal of what is to come for those who are left behind. Can you imagine the chaos, the sheer evil? We get upset when we put a mask on to go to the grocery store. Even now as we speak, there are Christian brothers in Afghanistan not wanting to go out in public or manifest their faith because there's a whole new sheriff in town there and he is not a good sheriff. It's called the Taliban. The world is getting to the point where we're looking at it right now with sheer disgust. You can only imagine what it's going to look like in the tribulation period. And you know, can I just be straight honest with you? I have struggled since making a transition from the full-time pastorate to being in Behold Israel. I have struggled because I've seen people living life, including me, going to and from events and all kinds of stuff, which we all do. We all do. We do those things. We go and take the, we do, we do kids' games and we travel and we do things. That's what we do. We do that. They, they did it back then too. But I fear many of us have forgotten. Maybe not those in the room here, maybe even if you're watching online, but those who are referenced to this video by a friend that gave it to you and shared it, that you, you're a Christian and you wear the, the Christian label. But if I was to look at your bank account and your priorities, if I was to look at your calendar and where you're spending your time, if I was to look at your attitudes and what your social media is pushing out to the world, what would be the fruit of what I would see? I've struggled with this. Because if we're not about the Father's business, which we're going to talk about, we could miss an opportunity for a soul to join us in the rapture that have to go through this pure chaos. Now, as you look at these ominous, putrefying images. I want it to sink in. 
I want you to know that the world will probably say, well, that's beautiful art because that's all they know. It's up to you and me to show them a better way, a more powerful way. Go to the top. Why would you settle for a puny God when you can go straight to the top? And here is the Antichrist, and you need to know about it, the beast from the sea, otherwise known as the Antichrist, the fake, counterfeit Messiah. Revelation chapter 13, verses 1 through 10. Then I stood on the sand of the sea, and I saw a beast rising up out of the sea, having seven heads and ten horns, and on his horns ten crowns, and his head's blasphemous name. Now the beast which I saw was like a leopard. His feet were like the feet of a bear, and his mouth was like the mouth of lion. Dragon gave him power, his throne, and great authority. We talked about that. We saw, we saw how these are the, 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 the empires going back in times. So that's why we know this is in the future. And John wrote this around 90 AD, verse 3, and I saw one of his heads as if it had been mortally wounded, and his deadly wound was healed. And all the world marveled and followed the beast. So they worshiped the dragon who gave authority to the beast, and they worshiped the beast saying, who is like the beast? Who is able to make war with him? And he was given a mouth speaking great things and blasphemies, and he was given authority to continue for 42 months. How long is 42 months? Three and a half years. We have better mathematicians than myself. You see, that, you see this coming together? So within that last... Three and a half years. Can I say all hell breaks loose on, on earth? Then he opened his mouth and blasphemy against God to blaspheme his name, his tabernacle, those who dwell in heaven. It was it's the abomination of desolation, according to Daniel. It was granted him to make war with the saints and overcome them. And authority was given to them to give it over every tribe, tongue, and nation. All who dwell on the earth will worship him, whose names have not been written in the book of life of the Lamb slain from the foundation of the world. And then it says this, if anyone has an ear, let him hear. He who leads into captive shall also go into captivity. And he who kills with a sword must be killed with the sword. And that's the Antichrist's destructive rampage. He will be destroyed. Here is the patience and the faith of the saints. See, it's good to know what the outcome of something is because when you're going through it, it feels horrible and you just don't know if you can stand a minute more. Some of us have been living in persecution the last two weeks, maybe the last month, and you say, when is this going to end? I wish I knew what the outcome is. I wish I knew what the results of my medical exam is going to be. I wish I knew if my nephew or my grandson is going to come to faith that I've been praying so hard for. I just wish I knew the outcome. Well, he wants you to know the outcome, the ultimate outcome, the most important outcome, is no matter what Satan tries to do to sell the world, it's going to end in his destruction. As it says in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, and it says right there in the text that he will destroy the Antichrist with the words of his mouth, the word of his mouth. Can you picture all the nations coming together? They're all worshiping the beast. They worship the image. We're going to cover the false prophet momentarily. And they're all sighted and they're chaos and, and they're looking for hope. They don't know Jesus is the hope. They have not gone to the top. They haven't been to the, the Lord of the Lords and the Kings of Kings. They've settled and they're coming together, and Jesus comes back, and no, no, they don't want to settle. They, they don't want to go to the top. They've settled their hatred and their fists in the air. It says in the, in the book of Revelation, they would not repent. They dug their heels within the ground. They would say, no, we don't want anything to do with, with the real deal. We're, we're satisfied with what we know. And they will want to battle with him. And as Jesus is coming back, they have their guns locked and loaded. Maybe it'll be spears. Maybe it'll be all kinds of other paraphernalia of warfare. And Jesus comes back, and there's a war. And all he has to say is, no. Enough. It stops now. You, come forward for judgment. Oh, yeah. Can you imagine? I don't know what it's going to be like. I'm just using my sanctified, hopefully sanctified imagination. The beast, in the, the beast from the earth is the false prophet, resembling the role of the Spirit of God. Remember what Jesus says, when I leave, I'm going to send you a counselor. Spirit of God comes into the believer. He advises. He's the Spirit of Christ. He draws you to worship him. Today, we worship Jesus, and the Spirit of God was directing our minds and our hearts. We felt something. 
It's not only the mind, it's the mind, emotions, and will. He engages the entire soul and brings us before Jesus' worship. Revelation chapter 13, 18 through, uh, 11 through 18. Then I saw another beast coming up out of the earth. One's from the sea, one's from the earth. What does that mean? Funny you should ask. We'll, we'll cover that in a minute. And he had two horns like a lamb and spoke like a dragon. And he exercises all the authority of the first beast in his presence and causes the earth and those who dwell on it to worship the first beast whose deadly wound was healed. See, Jesus conquers sin, death, and demonic forces in a weekend. It takes all of the wrath of God and of the Romans and rises and conquers. This guy is going to do a similar feat, but it's pipsqueak, puny, pathetic compared to what Jesus actually did. The world will marvel that this guy was able to heal from some kind of wound inflicted, and they'll rejoice and say, look, he's great. And Jesus is standing over there going, how pathetic. And by the way, you only have three and a half years, and then I'm coming to put this to an end. You're worshiping the right God, friends. If you're not worshiping Jesus, you are worshiping a fake. Don't be fooled. Don't fall through the ceiling thinking it's concrete because you're confused with all of the message being sent to you. One from the sea, one from the earth. Now, there's a lot of discussion about the interpretation of this. Let me offer you some thoughts. Could it be that the sea is the sea of, of the world, the peoples, the politics? Could it be? And that's how they referenced the, the, the phrase sea throughout the ancient Near East text and even the Bible in the Old Testament. It's, it's, it's numerous with the, the, the sea, the peoples. So whoever this person from the sea is, is going to be a great political, social engineer. The one that comes from the earth. The idea is, is that he comes from land. There is places of worship. Could it be that he comes from uh, the philosophy of the system or the world system that will be something he'll want to push, maybe? I'm not sure, but what we do know is, is that both will have a political and a religious component, and it will be religion-less in the sense that it won't have a label. It'll just be, worship the beast. The false prophet is pointing people to the beast, and the beast is receiving the worship, and the dragon is smiling, saying, this is the best thing that ever happened. <clears throat> and he's got his false, fake, counterfeit trinity operating. But there's a time stamp on it. He performs great signs, so that even makes fire come down from heaven, on earth in the sight of men, and he deceives those who dwell on the earth by those signs which he was granted to do in the sight of the beast, telling those who dwell on earth to take or make an image of the beast who was wounded by the sword and lived. So they're going to do an icon of the beast, and we already know who is the true icon of God the Father. It's Jesus, so they're going to be doing the same stuff, and it's going to have a catastrophic end. He was granted power to give breath to the image of the beast. This image, this icon, this statue, whatever it is, will somehow be able to operate and talk. That the image of the beast should both speak and cause as many as would not worship the image of the beast to be killed. You don't want to worship the beast? You're dead. He causes all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and slave, to receive the mark on their right hand and on their foreheads, and that no one may buy or sell except the one who has the mark of the beast and the number of his name. Here is wisdom. Let him who has understanding calculate the number of the beast, for it is the number of a man. His number is 666 or 666. All right, now we are going to go just a few minutes over um, if I tell you the next Hebraic illustration that may help your theological toolbox but you have to opt into it. You have to check the box. So I'm waiting. 
Okay. <laughs> All right. So, disclaimer, this will go over just a few minutes. This is my view, um, but it's based on history and evidence that I'll provide within three minutes. 666, or 666, I believe represents the very best man can do, just falling short of the perfect number of 777. I believe the power of three has always been part of Hebraic culture and still manifests itself in pop culture in Israel today. An example would be, if you really want to know how somebody is doing in Israel and they come from a Jewish background, ask them how they're doing three times and be careful how much time goes by between each of them. Let, let enough time cook. Because usually the third time they'll answer you and, and they'll be accurate. So if I go to a guy named Moshe, hey Moshe, Mashlamcha, how are you? He says, oh, I'm very good, I'm very good, thanks. We talk about the weather. Moshe, Mashlamcha, how is it going? You'll say, yeah, good, good, good. It's very good. Then we talk about cars and all kinds of cool stuff like turbochargers. Okay? And I say, Moshe, the guid, Mashlamcha, Moshe, tell me, how are you? Eh, you know, we're going through problem with my marriage. My kid it's, uh, has disease and uh, I lost my job last week. But uh, apart from that, it's good. Now, that's an extreme example, and if you went to Israel and you asked somebody three times, it doesn't mean that this is going to happen every time. But we do know that the power of three manifests itself in Scripture. One example is, Peter denied the Lord how many times? Three. Three. And the last time, he swore and he had a fit, because he wanted everybody to know that three times is absolute. I do not know this man. Enough. No, but you're, you're, you got a gallon. Enough. You have a gallon accent. No. No, no, no. 666. Man, man, man. Jesus comes back in the end of John. Peter, do you agape me? Would you unconditionally love me? You know that I phileo you. He felt bad. I can't agape you, but I can phileo love you, which is brotherly love. Jesus asks a second time, Peter, do you agape me? Lord, I phileo you. Each time Jesus is saying, feed my sheep or do something in ministry, it's almost like forgiveness is embedded within the whole teaching. I no longer worry about you denying me. We're well past that. In fact, I'm setting you up for leadership. He asked him a third time. He went down to Peter's level to an area of a starting point that Peter could do. And he says, instead of agape, he says, do you phileo me? And Peter says, I do. And Jesus says, then that's going to be our starting point. Because one day you will agape me. Three times Jesus asks him because he knows how he thinks and he wants Peter to know that he's forgiven and that he has mission, mission, mission rather than denial, 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 which is where he came from. And it's a beautiful picture. The legend goes in all of the writings that Peter was feeling unworthy to be crucified upright in Rome when they took him. And so he opted to be crucified upside down because he knew he was absolutely unworthy and it was his way of saying, Lord, may this be worship to you. I, as a man, am not worthy of you, and I recognize that, and I have accepted you, and I truly do agape you. And I may, may this be the symbol and proof of that to the world. The best of man, 666, saying no to God, 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 777, is what the world will do. Now, whether it means that or not, I don't know. What we do know is that this will be a symbol of some form. I don't know if it's a tattoo. I don't know if it's a chip. I don't know. Those people living in the tribulation will know. And if the book of Revelation is available, which it will be, they will then have a very big clue of what, what they should not take if they have sensitivity to Jesus. Now, gentlemen running the slides, I want you to jump to three weapons you have for spiritual warfare. I promise to come back to this. It says in the Bible that they overcame him. This is, this is the church or tribulation saints. It's the same strategy either way. They overcame him. That's, the, that's Satan, the dragon, the devil. By the blood of the lamb, word of their testimony, and they did not live their lives to the death. If you didn't understand, understand a word that we said, this is the 
This is the final gut punch, and we are, we are just a few minutes over. But you opted in with a checkbox. The, the, the blood of the lamb is something that's available and has been for 2,000 years since Jesus conquered sin, death, and demonic forces on the cross. You want to go straight to the top, the best God? You want to worship the Lord of Lords, the King of Kings, be assured of forgiveness? Do you want to have peace? Do you want to have purpose in your life? Let's delete that. Just the mere fact that if you receive the gift of his, of his offering, you have a relationship. Forget the benefits. The relationship with the real Jesus. Think about that. The world wants Jesus, they just don't know it. And the world has been deceived and they are drinking the Kool-Aid of the devil, which will only get worse. 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 8 and 9 says, Be sober, vigilant, because your adversary the devil walks around like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. Resist him steadfast in faith, knowing that the same sufferings are experienced by your brotherhood all, all over the world. In verse 9 it says, Resist him. You can. You can say no to temptation. You can say yes to his calling. And the devil stands by, and he's a loud voice, but he cannot get in your way. The gates of heaven, or the gates of hell will not prevail against the church when it decides to move. That's a gift you have right now as a restrainer with the Spirit of God in you that the tribulation saints will not necessarily have. But the blood of the Lamb, have you received the Lord Jesus Christ as your Lord and your Savior? Has there been a time in your life where you've said, I need you, Jesus. I'm coming clean. I'm imperfect. I'm a sinner, and I receive your forgiveness, and I'm asking you into my heart to be my Lord and Savior and for you to have full reign on my future. If you have that, you're a child of God. You can go into any situation, and the Spirit of God can do his work through you. Two, the words of testimony. More now than ever, as it says, that if you want to defeat Satan in the public square, at home, share God stories. The man that mentored me said, Mike, be always bragging about Jesus. You guys will never believe what just happened last night. Jesus, 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 Jesus. Now, you know, you can go too far with this and overcook the goose. But I don't think any of us are really doing that. In fact, I don't think we're doing this enough. It says in John 15, well, when the helper comes, he's referring to the spirit, whom I will send to you from the Father, the spirit of truth, who proceeds from the Father, he will bear witness about me, and you will also bear witness because you have been with me from the beginning. If we are going to take territory, we not only need the blood of Jesus to be saved, but we need to share stories. Well, I don't have any stories. Ask God to use you in miraculous ways and wait and see what happens. Oh, yeah. Be prepared. Some of you may be scared to pray that. Lord, I want to do your will, whatever it is. I submit myself to you, and I want to be the person that tells the stories of your power instead of the one that always listens. That airman sat on that couch in the Air Force, and I shared how Jesus rescued me from my crazy past. And he walked away with a smile, and he said, I'm going to think a lot more about this and I'm going to analyze, you know, and compare the, Nor the Norsk gods to Christianity. And he said, thanks, chaplain. That's, you've given me a lot to think about. Lastly, you're going to hate this one. Not loving your life. John chapter 12. Most assuredly, I say to you, Jesus says to you, unless a grain of wheat falls into the ground and dies, it remains alone. But if it dies... It produces much grain. He who loves his life will lose it. You're going to lose your life anyway. And he who hates his life in this world will keep it for eternal life. If anyone serves me, let him follow me. 
And where I am, there my servant will be also. If anyone serves me, him, him, or her, if anyone serves me, him my Father will honor. Whether before the tribulation or after. So there was a hole there. And the sunlight was shining through. I, I had auto parts all around me. Broken glass. And all of a sudden, I saw this face. It's Victor Blanc. And I saw this face block the sun. And this face looked like this. <laughs> he was sure that I was either severely injured or dead. I know that because he told me after. He said, Mike, I don't know English, but maybe I should start learning. And then I said, maybe I should learn better German so we don't have this confusion. He said, I have never, I never thought that, that anybody could survive that kind of flood. It was on concrete, by the way. This wasn't even carpet or wood. Later on, there were three women praying, and they were in this office. They just got up, and they decided to pray for safety at precisely the same time that I fell. It just, whoa, it just, whoa. Don't you want to be engaged in the Lord's work to the point where you have seismic differences that if you don't engage your faith on this level, the blood of the Lamb, the word of testimony, and not loving your lives to the end, it's about Jesus. It's not about us and all of our world that we want to create. It's about glorifying Jesus. That, if you're willing to die to yourself, you will be the storyteller of the true, the true Godhead, the true Messiah, and all of the, the mission that he has for you here on this earth. If we don't do it, I don't want to think about it. Let's pray. Let's all stand as we close. Lord, I know there's many people here that want to hear what your word has to say about end times. And I do too. Lord, sometimes if you're praying with me right now, even online, sometimes we forget, Lord, and we confess as a people, we forget sometimes that you are worthy of our entire being. We need to die completely to ourselves so that you may truly live. And that is where everything works according to your design. And we get to see things that we would not normally see. I pray for all of us, Lord, even now as we head out um, in a minute to lunch, that you give us great fellowship, great idea exchange, great, great processing of what we heard from the two teachings this morning. But Lord, don't let us sleep or slumber, be apathetic about those around us that still are not attached in worshiping you. If there's an area of my life, Lord, your, your life, watching this or hearing this right now, identify it, confess it, bring it to him. Is there a room in your life that's secret? Bring it forth. Let the light shine on it and let Jesus do his work. Jesus, I give you all of myself. I die to myself. May you rule and reign. We thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray.